Well, it's a pleasure to, to uh, come and talk. Uh, the, what I'm going to discuss today is uh, the issue of obesity prevention in, or, uh, in very young people. And Bill has, uh, Bill Dietz pointed out to us all of the efforts that are, you know, finally showing what I believe is some effect in preventing obesity. I mean, this was a very disappointing field until the last, I'd say, six or eight years. And as Bill pointed out, we now have uh, evidence that the prevalence of obesity is uh, leveled off in children for at least about the last six or seven years. And the optimistic uh, interpretation of that is, well, all the things that we're doing are finally working. And if I were running an obesity prevention program, I would take that position. The pessimist's you know, uh, interpretation is that human beings are now eating as much as they possibly, you know, practically can and are being as physically inactive as they practically can, and this is where the body weight has leveled off. Now, uh, my position in this talk is that maybe the reason that we've had difficulty in prevention in older children is because we're missing the developmental windows that we now know exist and which, uh, although the extent of those in humans is not entirely clear, and that uh, we need to actually think about obesity prevention efforts earlier. So uh, forward here. Okay, the big the big arrow. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to uh, discuss with you the results of what I think is the earliest age uh, children's study that was of any significant size with respect to prevention. Now you know, adult studies have alpha male acronyms such as attack and ninja and things like this. Well, pediatric studies have much more user-friendly names. So this was the Hip Hop to Health study, and it dealt with three to five-year-old children. It was a 14-week preschool intervention with a two-year follow-up. And the study was actually performed three times. In the first study in African-American children, there was an effect on the follow-up adjusted BMI score in which the children who, bar who uh, got the intervention had a, a uh, 0.35 BMI unit Z-score uh, improvement over those that didn't. So this was a very positive result. And the investigators, Marion uh, Fitzgibbon in this case, thought she ought to do it again. Well, she did it the second time in Hispanic children, and there was absolutely no effect at all. Then she did it a third time, uh, and the third uh, study data are only available to the end of the intervention, as, I'm, uh, as, as I believe. Not to the, they're not two-year follow-up data, but she again showed no effect. There was no effect on actual BMI Z-score, even uh, and on energy intake, but there was an effect on physical activity and decreasing screen time. And this means that somewhere we violated the energy balance equation, because if you didn't eat any more and you had increased physical activity, something should have happened, but she didn't. So it depends on how you want to interpret these studies, but you know, given the absolutely you know, sort of contradictory nature of the conclusions, you have to say that we don't have any great evidence uh, of a prevention, uh, of effective prevention study in this particular age group. Now, there are some younger studies, and they're all pilot studies, some even in the first year of life. But three to five-year-olds, uh, to me, are uh, potentially well beyond the developmental window. Now, anybody who does pediatrics knows that part of the reason you study older children is because it's really hard to study toddlers, okay, or infants. But the fact is that there are things happening there that we need to be aware of that uh, should lead us to look into those groups. So. As Larry mentioned, you know, sort of the traditional preventive health paradigm is you have non-metabolic risk factors such as your genes, your age, your gender, even though people change gender today. Uh, and you have the so-called modifiable risk factors that are things like eating habits and physical activity. But the modifiable risk factors may not be so modifiable after all because there are heritable components to those or uh, we've had closure of developmental windows, which makes it more difficult to deal with them. So it doesn't mean that you can't modify these things later, but it means it's actually more difficult than we've thought it was in the past. So we have various so-called modifiable eating habits, like eating rate, responsiveness to satiety, uh, enjoyment of food, eating in the absence of hunger, and now there are significant data or available data in children 
and these are you know, children's data that show that there's a high heritability component to these so-called behavioral, you know, uh, eating behavioral activities. And again, as I said, it doesn't mean you can't modify them, but it means that maybe half of the response is determined by things that are not directly within your control. And by the way, because of the limits of time, I'm showing single examples here, and most of the things I'm going to talk about have many more, uh, much more supporting data. So here we have the fact that we have heritable components, which is not just genetic, but heritable components of things that we think we should be able to easily modify or, or modify. The second is that, as Bill Dietz you know, mentioned, uh, we know that there are dietary and uh, obesity-related maternal effects on the outcome of children with regard to obesity. So there's one of the very firm facts is mothers who enter pregnancy obese are more likely to have children who become obese, and there are things about maternal diet that make one you know, very concerned about what's happening in the periconceptional area and in the, the early postnatal area. And these deal with the epigenetic effects on the regulation of gene expression. So this is a study by Rob Waterland in which uh, I'm showing you pictures of two genetically identical mice. These are adult genetically identical siblings of mothers who received increased methylation diets during pregnancy, that is diets that contain folate, B12, and things that increase the methylation of, in this case, the agouti-related, uh, you know, the agouti protein gene. And this, uh, these mice become obese. The increased methylation allows the mice to maintain their coat color and body weight. Decreased methylation of those genes allows the mice to become obese and uh, have a lighter coat color because of the effect of uh, the agouti-related protein on blocking uh, MSH action on the melanocortin receptor. So these are, these are uh, uh, our, uh, offspring who have widely different obese phenotypes based on maternal diet. Now, these studies have been extended to early postnatal diets, to other uh, you know, types of uh, methylation effects, but this is actually scary. Okay? So this is exciting on the scientific basis, but it's truly you know, a bit troublesome in the sense that if, these, if there are maternal dietary effects of this nature in animals, okay, and that these contribute to the observed epidemiologic associations in humans, we have to be very concerned about the, the uh, health or the body weight health of mothers as they enter pregnancy and the diets of mothers and during pregnancy. Uh, this is, these sort of epigenetic marks are not only, uh, uh, you know, dem demonstrated in animals, there are now human data, and in this case we have data from, uh, from the Gambia in which there are two seasons of the year, the so-called rainy season, which is actually the hungry season, and the dry season in which there's widely available food. Now these are methylation of several genes in children, okay, who are, I believe, about six or nine years old, depending upon whether they were conceived in the rainy or hungry season or in the dry season. And there's distinct differences in the methylation of these genes depending upon the season of conception. These kind of data exist also in other human circumstances, such as the, what's now been called, what's been, what is called the Dutch hunger winter, where children were conceived in Holland during the Second World War, during the period of German-imposed starvation of, of uh, the Dutch population. So we have human examples where there are permanent alterations in the methylation of genes that affect gene expression from what happens during gestation. Okay. The other thing that changes the playing field are all the data that now exists on the permanent wiring of the brain that is affected by diet and uh, you know, uh, the hormones that affect appetite and satiety during critical periods of development in, in mice. So in this case, I'm showing here studies, oops, back. Okay, where's the, uh, all right. Studies in, in mice in which leptin, this is on the left-hand side here, we have uh, ex vivo cultures in which leptin is added, and it may be very hard to see this with the lights up. Leptin is added to uh, the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus and 
leptin is responsible for increased neural dendrite connections of the hypothalamic nuclei. Okay. And uh, I'm getting a warning, I think, there. Is that? Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, the s leptin is responsible for the connections that come from the arcuate nucleus, okay, that extend out to all the other hypothalamic nuclei in rodents. And if you take a rodent who has no leptin in the OBOB -OB mouse, these connections take much longer to develop, they're delayed, and their intensity is on the order of 10% those of the non-leptin uh, deficient mice. And what's interesting here is that if these mice receive leptin during the postnatal life, early postnatal life, you can reverse the effects of the, and you can improve these neural connections in the hypothalamus. But if you do, if you give the animals leptin as an adult, it has no effect. Again, suggesting a developmental window where you permanently alter the wiring of the hypothalamic uh, appetite and satiety centers which in theory, and I guess in practice, means that when you try to do something about those later in life, you have less, uh, less chance of success. This is another similar related study with the agouti related protein and MSH, immunoreacti immunoreactivity in the paraventricular nucleus of animals have an, who have another intervention, a more practical intervention that uh, affects body weight. So there's been a longstanding model in rodents in which you can affect the body weight uh, of adult rodents by altering how many uh, pups the mother has to feed during postnatal life. So if you take a normal litter over here and you take a litter which uh, uh, has uh, uh, dietary, has, uh, in which the pups, number of pups that the mother has to feed has been increased by about 50%, it's been known for a long time that this Competition, increased competition for maternal food uh, reduces the body weight of the adults. And what you can see here again is that there's a vast difference in the neural connections of these large litter infants than, uh, compared to the normal litter infants. In other words, a permanent change in the hard wiring of the hypothalamic appetite and satiety centers on the basis of what's happened during a critical developmental window. Now, do these kind of things exist in humans? This is a study from Julie Manella at the uh, uh, Monell Center in, in uh, Philadelphia in which she's taken children who are, in this case, the controlled children here. These are children who are, uh, I'm sorry, this, this is the cow's milk uh, formula, CMF, cow's milk formula control group, which is here, and the children who are receiving uh, a formula called Nutramagen, which is a protein hydrolysate formula, which tastes terrible, okay? It's absolutely terrible tasting formula. So in this case, we have infants here who are, not, who are studied at seven and a half months who have been eating this formula all of their life, and they have absolutely no problem eating it, okay? Nice and quiet. Now you take the infants who have been fed cow's milk formula, you give them the same Nutramagen at seven and a half months, and they don't like it at all, okay? Now, Julie has gone on to show that, this, that at one month, there's no difference in these groups, okay? And somewhere between one and three or four months, there's a flavor preference that develops, okay, which is, uh, you know, obviously, potentially has, uh, you know, great influence on what the infants may be interested in eating when they get older. Okay. There's also a salt preference that develops in the first few months of life. Infants are born salt neutral, that is, they don't have any preference one way or the other for salty solutions. These are infants who received, at two months of age, you see that these two groups of infants have essentially no difference in how they tolerate exposure to a salt solution. But the infants here, okay, in the solid line, are infants who have been exposed to, to foods that contain salt. Now, even though the American Academy of Pediatrics says that infants don't require anything but milk for the first six months of life, uh, something like 90% of the infants in this study had already received some kind of solid food, such as baby food. Surprisingly, 50% of the infants in this study had received table food of some kind in this period of life. But as you can see, there's a vast difference in how they tolerate salt solutions at six months of life, depending upon whether they were exposed to salt during the intervening period. 
The other kind of thing that happens very early in life is the uh, acceptance of large portion sizes and what effects that that has on ultimate eating behavior. Every study that I know of that has, has tested large portion sizes against smaller portion sizes show that when large portions are put in front of people, they eat more. This happens as early as two to three years of age, okay, where on the order of 20 or 5 to 30 percent more food is eaten if a child gets a larger portion in front of them than a smaller portion. What, no one knows the reason for this, okay, but it says that there are cues, there are sensory cues, visual cues, whatever, okay, that help set how much food a child takes, even as early as two or three years of age. And in fact, as you might expect, when they take larger portions, okay, of the entree in black here, okay, they take smaller amounts of all the other stuff, like fruits, vegetables, and dairy. So there's real reason to be concerned about these effects and what effects they ultimately have on obesity, okay, things that are established before somehow that we don't understand before the age of two. Okay, and my final point relates to that, and it's the widespread observation, and I think John Foret will probably address this, is that knowledge base doesn't equate with behavior base. So we have all sorts of stuff, efforts, based on the fact that, well, if people really understood this and they knew the consequences, they would do something different. Well, anybody who's been in medicine for any field knows that that just isn't the case. There's a whole set of behavioral cues or drivers, okay, that it's like, uh, you know, parallel lines, the knowledge base and the behavior base. They go along together, okay, but they're not directly connected, uh, or at least they're not connected as intimately as people would like to believe. Now, my reason for showing this slide is we know virtually nothing about the determinants of behavior in infants, and in food and in appetite and satiety eating behaviors, or in physical activity behaviors for that matter, we have very limited data on what the how these develop and why, and until we understand that, we're going to have very limited ability to interfere with them, uh, you know, and, and have success in interfering with them. So, with that, I'll stop. Thank you.